Hey everybody, this is Tom Oldham with Dynamic Velocity. Uh, decided to go live tonight to answer any questions that you may have about the start of the season or managing uh, your pitching staff. Uh, so we'll give folks a couple minutes to join. If you have any questions, uh, you can just leave a comment and we'll be able to pull them onto the screen and, and answer them. And just wanted to make sure that we're live. It looks like we are. So one of the one of the reasons that I want to go live tonight is obviously this is a unprecedented situation, very unique in terms of the pandemic, the start of the season, and essentially players have been in training mode for quite some time now. So very antsy about getting back onto the field, facing live hitters, having competitive games, those sorts of things. But we also need to be aware that <clears throat> the basically where players are at on a specific team is going to vary um, pretty significantly. So there are some guys who have been uh, continuing to throw. There are some guys who have not been throwing. And there are also some guys who have been throwing, also getting mound work and uh, most recently starting to ramp up into a live live AB session. So I think it's important to get a pulse of your players in terms of where they're at and with their arm and what they've been doing over the last two months, not from a place of judgment, but just from a place of being able to prepare as you're starting to finalize your season schedule and what that what that rotation looks like for um, for your staff. I will say the, um, the thing that I have noticed, even from players that are training, the difference in training and playing in a game is, is pretty significant. So there are some guys who have been training for the last, you know, few months, two months, and now we're basically building them up to get into a live AB session and their volume on the mound before live ABs was probably 25 to 30, sometimes 35 pitches uh, with very little fatigue. All of their pitches uh, getting through uh, the bullpen pretty strong with, uh, again, no signs of fatigue and then when we put them in a situation where they're facing live hitters, uh, it's, it's much different. So not only do they have the, the, the bullpen warm up, just getting yourself you know, physically ready for the game, getting all your pitches loose, where you're essentially getting to probably around 20, 25 pitches, then you're getting into the game and uh, having the inning. Uh, average number of pitches per inning is somewhere between you know, 12 and 15. Uh, so if they're going one inning, two innings in the live AB session, uh, we're probably pushing them then again for another, you know, close to 30 pitches if they do two sets. And the thing that I've noticed is at this time of year, typically players are in, in pretty good shape, uh, kind of mid-season form or close to mid-season form. Uh, that's definitely not the case right now. Pitchers are even if they have been throwing, even if they have been training, showing signs of fatigue pretty quickly after uh, you know one to two sets of, of live ABs. So with practices getting going next uh, Monday, I would really uh, suggest that you get into, for the pitchers who have been training, who have been throwing, uh, get into some sort of a scrimmage inner squad situation where they can continue to build their volume and start to get into more uh, game shape as opposed to training shape. Because again, these players have been in training mode for quite some time now. So game mode is gonna be much different, a little bit of a shock to the system. So I think it's gonna be important as soon as you get going, everybody's, um, I think it's important for the guys who have been throwing to start to really get into 
uh, live AB sessions, inner squad sessions, uh, those, those sorts of things. The players who have been throwing, but not necessarily um, on the mound, I would not put them in an inner squad session or uh, jump right into live ABs. Those are the guys who um, need to go through a ramp up. Um, hopefully this is a small number of players uh, just because you really don't have the luxury of having a long ramp up with practices starting June 1st, games starting on June 18th. Uh, it's a pretty quick ramp up. So you'll want to make sure that uh, they're spacing out their bullpen sessions uh, getting all of their pitches, um, you know, the command of all of their pitches through the bullpen sessions, uh, but then also working in recovery days, long toss days, uh, depending on, you know, your field time, your practice time, when they can get out and actually throw and if the, if the weather cooperates. Um, for the other guys who have not been throwing, hopefully this is nobody because now that we know that you guys are going to get started on June 1st, um, hopefully, hopefully everybody is throwing. Uh, those are the players that really need to um, be be watched and made sure that they're uh, preparing adequately and not trying to do too much too soon. So um, I'll pause there. Um, throw out a comment here if anybody has any um, questions. Throw it out there, and then if you have any questions, you can just type them into the comments. Um, I can pull them onto the screen, and and we can go through them. The 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 one thing that I did want to talk about uh, that I do think at the youth level is a positive uh, is that I'm hearing that there's very um, few tournaments, or a lot of tournament tournaments have been um, canceled. And the reason that I think that that's a, a, a positive thing is there, there would be a, a large number of games condensed, obviously, into a couple days, which would make it very difficult to um, manage your staff and have your, have your players um, spaced out appropriately in terms of uh, their innings, their work, uh, adequate rest, uh, that sort of a thing, with only the two weeks of practice before, before the games start. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more time to, uh, you know, get players through that ramp up period, uh, get a good pulse on how uh, arms are, um, what players have been doing, that sort of a thing. The other, the other aspect to this is I know that a lot of leagues go on uh, total pitches or number of innings thrown. And for the players who train with me, they know that I'm not a fan of that approach because there's uh, a big difference between throwing, you know, 50 pitches in two innings or 50 pitches over uh, six innings. Much different from a fatigue standpoint, from uh, just overall the stress that you're uh, putting on your body, putting on your arm in a longer duration of time over those you know, six innings, five innings, six innings with 50 pitches as opposed to um, two, uh, potentially two or whatever innings uh, in throwing those 50 pitches. So put together uh, this chart here, which shows um, total pitches per inning. And I just wanted to walk through that and, and go through exactly what I, what I mean by this. So you'll notice here, in the green box, uh, this would be 15 pitches or less. Total pitches per inning is good. Pitcher could remain in the game. And again, this is if the pitcher is in shape, is at a point where um, you know they're they're ramped up enough or they're built up enough to where they can go one to three innings um, with little to no fatigue. And 
uh, they, they should be they should be fine if guys are just getting on on the mound come June 1st um, you know having them go more than one or two innings is, is probably not a not a smart idea in my opinion and again that 15 is really where the average number of pitches in an inning is, is typically around 12 to 15 so then when we go to um, the right with 15 to 25 pitches uh, this is really where the, the pitcher should be monitored and to me this is regardless of if the pitcher is um, or has been training or hasn't been training uh, they need to be monitored this early in the season uh, to determine if they should go back out there this is where they're going to start to uh, fatigue uh, the inning probably isn't going as they planned and uh, just overall their their number of pitches uh, is, is starting to get up there. The As we continue to the right, the, the, the orange box, uh, 26 to 30, uh, that's where uh, the pitcher should be replaced if the previous inning uh, was in the 15 to uh, 25 pitch range or higher. Uh, and I would say early in the season, uh, so basically through June, the if, if you have a pitcher who's throwing 26 to 30 pitches per inning, uh, they should be replaced that inning or uh, they should not go out for the next inning just from a fatigue standpoint and uh, probably a bad inning if, if you're throwing that many pitches and it's it's too many pitches early in the season to um, have that happen or have that occur in multiple innings uh, in my opinion so even though the, the note here says pitcher should be replaced if previous inning uh, was in the 15 to 25 uh, pitch range or higher. If it's early in the game, early in the season, I would, I would, um, I would say if they get to that point, then they they should be replaced along with that that red box where uh, pitchers should not be should not remain in the game if they get over 30 pitches in the inning. And that's where uh, hopefully that provides some context to my earlier comment around. Uh, not having so many tournaments. I think that's actually a beneficial thing where you can space some of your pitchers out. You won't have to feel like you have to throw everybody the first weekend. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can have a little bit more of a, a ramp up period. So we have a, a question here. How long is the ramp up period? Um, the, the ramp up period is is again, it's gonna depend on the um, players and where they're at with their arms. So we want to, or my suggestion is, when you get into practice on June 1st, you're getting an assessment of where all of your players are. Some players have been doing a lot of mound work, some haven't done any mound work. Some have been playing catch every day, uh, but not necessarily at a high intensity. Uh, some have been uh, you know, throwing at a high intensity for a long time. So it's important to get a pulse of uh, where all of your pitchers are at and then match that up with how you plan to use them throughout the season. So you really, you had some time with them, uh, you know, late fall, winter, but you probably don't know yet, you know, who you're gonna be throwing the first game, second game, third game. So this would allow you some time to assess where your players are at, and then determine for that specific player how long their ramp up period should be. If you've got a guy who, you know, in the last three weeks has, you know, one to two bullpens per week on the mound, and they're throwing 20 to 25 pitches, uh, they've been long tossing, they've been consistently throwing, uh, consistently doing strength training, their arms are in probably pretty good shape. So their ramp up period could be where you know you start practice on June 1st, you're getting into an inner squad or live ABs or, or practice games or whatever, um, where they're starting their ramp up period on the mound um, that day, if they have been throwing bullpens and trying to build up volume in that manner where they're you know throwing one, maybe two innings uh, against their own team or doing a couple of different sets of live ABs uh, where you're uh, really monitoring their uh, pitch count through those through those live ABs. So that's one um, category of pitchers. 
if you've got pitchers who um, have been uh, playing catch consistently, uh, but really don't have a lot of mound work, I would use the, uh, basically it's two and a half weeks um, to start to get them to ramp up on the mound. So the idea here would be they're not facing hitters in those two weeks of practice. They're throwing bullpens, uh, first, you know, fastball change up then start to mix up, mix in their breaking balls. And that would allow them two and a half weeks of ramp up where you could get quite a bit of work done. Uh, I would space it out, you know, two to three days in between each bullpen and build it to where you have, uh, you know, long toss days, recovery days, light throwing days, building into the bullpen. I think that would be a, a good approach um, with those guys who have been playing catch consistently but haven't had a lot of mound work. Um, again, we don't want to ramp that category of pitchers up too soon because, and what I mean by ramping up too soon is getting them to face hitters. Um, before they're ready to face hitters because there's just a different dynamic when you're on the mound and you're throwing to a catcher in a bullpen setting as opposed to you're on the mound throwing to a catcher and there's a hitter in the box. Uh, there's just players react differently as they should and the adrenaline starts pumping and try to do more than you're probably ready to do. So as coaches, I think it's important to manage that through bullpens and uh, build them up over that two and a half weeks of practice. Then at the start of games on the 18th, then you can essentially put them in the category that that first, that those first pitchers were in to where now for the first, you know, two, two and a half weeks of games, now you're starting to build in their game volume where they're going one, maybe two innings if they have a good first inning, and then building that in in over time. So again, hopefully the large majority of your pitchers are in the first category and not necessarily the second category. That'll make it much easier to uh, manage your staff. And then for the third um, category, and, and again, I'll reiterate, hopefully this isn't any pitchers where they really haven't been doing any, anything. Um, they, they need to get their arm in shape and it's probably not a good idea to have them ramp up at the same rate as uh, the pitchers in the second category. So how I would handle this here is over the two and a half weeks of practice, um, for the first week and a half, they're starting to get into more of just their building in their throwing volume and throwing intensity, uh, whether that be uh, through long toss or you know whatever um, method that you depending on your field situation that you have access to and how long they can stretch it out. Um, build a plan to get those guys ramped up in throwing volume over, I would say a week and a half, monitor how they're doing. And then at that point, start to slowly build them into mound work. Um, but again, hopefully it's a small um, number of pitchers. Hopefully it's none of your pitchers, frankly. But that is, uh, important, I feel, with the condensed season, uh, the fact that these players have been in training mode for uh, quite a number of months, and the I'm anticipating that there's going to be a lot of practices and a lot of games in, in a short period of time. So we need to make sure that we're recovering well, that we're preparing well, and we're not we're not just looking at the schedule and saying, okay, I've got X number of pitcher, pitchers <clears throat> for X number of games, and this is how we're going to make it work. But um, see if you have any other questions or anything. And then for the players, one of the things that I wanted to touch on is how important the uh, routine on the mound is going to be. So there's going to be a lot of emotions that you're feeling as you're getting onto the mound. Not only just you're excited to, uh, to just get onto the mound and um, pitch, 
but at the end of the day, you have a job to do on the mound and that excitement or that um, excess adrenaline that you may be having needs to be channeled into what the task is when you're on the mound. And for the players that I train, they probably are sick of me saying this, but uh, it's really pitch and location. Um, you, when you're on the mound, what, what are you throwing? Uh, where are you throwing it is really your sole purpose. And the weather, uh, the fact that, you know, there may be people in the stands that are, that are wearing masks or everybody, you know, it's different because everybody's spread out. There's going to be a lot of differences in what you're used to uh, in a game setting. And you have, to, you have to prepare for that before you get on the mound uh, so you're not caught off guard and, and you just expect it when you get on the mound. That way all of your thoughts, all of your emotions, and your um, focus on the mound can be put towards uh, your, your pitch and location. And that will help to slow your heart rate down, slow your breathing down, allow you to have uh, clear thoughts as opposed to emotional thoughts when you're on the mound, which is very, very important, especially when we're trying to manage uh, your energy level and trying not to fatigue too quickly because you're not in game shape yet and you're so excited to get back on the mound. So uh, it's important to do everything you can to conserve that energy and uh, direct your thoughts towards the, the task at hand. Um, Todd asked a question here that I'll pull up onto the screen. Uh, it says, are these pitch counts age specific? Uh, and no, I, I, I don't believe that they're age specific. I think they apply to um, all levels and it's important to uh, take it into consider. And when he, when he says, are these pitch counts age specific? Let me pull up here. Um, this is what uh, Todd is referring to with the uh, total pitches per inning. The reason that I'm saying that this is not age specific is it, it really doesn't matter if you're nine years old or you're 16 years old. If you're throwing 30 plus pitches in an inning, things probably aren't going very well. Um, if you're doing that over multiple innings, then things probably aren't going well for a longer period of time, meaning you're out there longer on the mound, that's when that fatigue is setting in. And um, a lot of times we see where mechanics start to break down, players start to make adaptations in their mechanics to just execute the pitch because they're, uh, because they're tired, they're losing energy. So uh, it's not age specific. I think you can apply those uh, across the board. But again, I think coaches have somewhat of a challenging job here in the, in the next month to assess where their pitchers are at, get a game plan together to ramp up before games start, and then once uh, games start, really managing um, pitch count. Again, this is not how most uh, you know leagues or tournaments are organized where they're um, measurement is more total pitches or total innings and this is more of my idea in terms of what I think matters as opposed to total number of, of um, innings that a player's thrown or total number of pitches. In my experience, uh, you know, personally when I was in a game, there's some games where I would throw uh, you know, over a hundred pitches but I threw the entire game and felt great afterwards. Uh, there were some games where I threw, you know, 80, 90 pitches in four innings and I felt terrible because uh, it's just more output over a shorter um, period of time and uh, that's, when, that's when I think players can really put themselves in a, in a bad situation and we really don't want to be doing that early. Well, we really don't want to be doing that ever, but especially early in the season when uh, it's been a while since these guys have uh, been out onto the field. So that's the main thing that I wanted to um, cover tonight, throw out here.
we have any any last questions. And I will say for the players, you know, I was talking about how important it is for the mound routine and uh, focusing your thoughts to pitch and location. The way that we do this uh, with the players that we train is really the establishment of what we call triggers. So a trigger is going to be uh, basically a cue that then the player recognizes because we want the cue to be obvious and it triggers uh, their thought pattern, which triggers their behavior pattern, which hopefully triggers uh, positive results. So we, we talk to players about uh, different aspects of the, the game and different uh, time and spaces on the field. And what I mean by that is you can have a trigger to where when you're getting onto the mound, as soon as you hit the dirt of the mound, that could be a trigger where your cue is your thoughts need to go directly to pitch and location. Not what the weather is, not who's getting into the batter's box, not how you're feeling, um, but a specific trigger to get your thoughts directed towards uh, the task at hand. Uh, another trigger could be on how you're preparing uh, for the game. So as soon as you hit the bullpen mound, that trigger could be, I want to uh, manage my energy level. I want to make sure I have the feel of all of my pitches. Uh, and I want to be very positive about what's about to happen in this game. So the, the trigger, again, could be going through the gate of the fence to get to the bullpen mound. It could be once you hit the bullpen mound pitching rubber, uh, whatever it may be. That then is the cue to then trigger those thoughts. And we want those thoughts to be positive and very directed towards um, uh, those behaviors that we want to have uh, as we're leading up to, um, to, to the game. Another trigger could be um, how you're, if you're a pitcher, how you're leaving the field and uh, getting into the dugout. So the trigger could be that first step into the dugout or as you're approaching uh, the fence of the dugout, that would then trigger your job is done on the mound, at least for that inning, and now you need to support your teammates. Um, and, and how do you want to show up doing that? Do you want to be the guy who uh, sits on the bench, puts a towel over his head and doesn't want to talk to anybody? Or are you at the fence encouraging uh, your, your team as, the, as they're hitting? So it's just thinking through the different aspects of the game and uh, the different areas that you're going to be on the field and how do you want to show up to each of those. And by doing this, not only does it help prepare you for what you're about to um, you know, go through, but then also it gives you uh, an opportunity after the game to reflect on how you showed up to your, your pregame work, how you showed up to your bullpen work, how you showed up um, on the mound, in the batter's box, in the dugout, after the game, um, to, to really assess all that, to figure out, is this, um, you know, again, how I want to be showing up as a player. So a lot of times people throw out, trust the process, and that's really what we mean by um, trusting the process, is that process is that, that um, preparation to say, I know what I'm going to be going through, visualizing it, and then identifying triggers that you want to have consistently um, uh, to elicit those thoughts, behaviors, and then ultimately positive outcomes. So I think it would help um, players not only uh, you know throughout the season, but especially as uh, practices and games are getting started when there's been such a long training period. Players are very excited to get out and practice and play, uh, which they should be. Um, but we don't want that excitement to override um, the, the longer term approach to the, to the season. You don't want to uh, you know, feel great the first game, go out and throw six innings, and then now you, know, you can't move your arm for the next um, four days. Uh, need to be smart about the approach onto the mound. And that really comes through preparation now in the, the, the practice schedule and, and everything starting next Monday. So to recap, 
Uh, again, if you have any questions, you can throw them out here and we can answer them. But to recap, um, starting next Monday, I would get an assessment of all of your pitchers, where they're at, how much throwing they've been doing, if they've had any mound work, um, uh, what that mound work has been, have they thrown any live hitters. And then uh, that will give you a good assessment of where your staff is at. And then you can build ramp up um, periods for each of the staff and throwing programs for each of the staff as you start to figure out who's going to be your game one starter, game two starter, uh, you know, who's going to be relievers, uh, that sort of a thing. Uh, the other thing uh, we talked through is the total pitches per inning and how to know uh, when to replace your pitcher. These are my thoughts. I, I understand that uh, games and tournaments are ne not necessarily organized this way, and it's more um, total pitches as opposed to, um, or total pitches or total innings as opposed to total pitches per inning. But I think this is a good barometer for coaches to have in their back pocket if you're in a game and you have that question mark in your head in terms of, well, you know, he's only been out there for two innings or one inning or two inning, but the pitch count's starting to ramp up. This hopefully is a good um, good resource to say, yeah, he probably shouldn't go out there or he would be okay to go out there another inning. And then finally, um, for the players in terms of preparing for practice and games, identify those triggers on the field. Um, and again, by triggers, we mean those cues that are gonna elicit uh, those positive thoughts. Uh, which would hopefully elicit those positive behaviors and uh, the outcomes that we're looking for. So planning to do more of these live Q&A sessions. Uh, if you have any questions that you didn't answer tonight or you didn't think of until after we were done, uh, feel free to shoot me a message and I'll answer them on the next show. Thanks.